<laughs> you don't have to. Okay. Uh, well, our next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Craig Gunderson, Mapping Food Insecurity from the University of Illinois. Is the soybean industry and road professor, uh, and also uh, university this, uh, laboratory is director of uh, national soybean research laboratory. Yeah. Please. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all very much for, for coming to this session. There's a lot of other really neat sessions going on. I mean, there's another session of neat papers. So I appreciate you, all of you being here. So uh, I'll, I'll speak quickly so we can get through in th this in enough time. Um, I originally, the name of the paper originally was Mapping Food Insecurity, and Prashant uh, Kalita was so nice to accept it, but he said you better say something about post-harvest loss. So I've structured this a bit differently, so I'm going to be talking about post-harvest loss in the context of I'm a food security person. That's my area of research. I'm not a post-harvest loss one. But I'm actually, I think I'm the only one at this conference who is talking about food security, per se. So uh, maybe this will be of some interest or not. I don't know. We'll see. Okay. But here is, so, um, oh, this, I should acknowledge my co-authors. This is done with Elaine Waxman, who's at Urban, and then Amy, Amy Lee Angler and Amy Crumble, who are at Feed in America, which is the umbrella organization for food banks in the United States. Okay, why do we care about post-harvest loss? Whenever there's a question or anything, is you always have to say, do we care about this issue? And so, and, and I wanna pose two things is, okay, so for environmental reasons, we may care about, about um, post-harvest loss. So as an example is we might say that it's a suboptimal use of scarce resources. I'm not going to go into this. I, I'd have to be convinced of this before I say this, but you know, that's one possible reason. But what, the thing that I'm concerned about then is with respect to food security. Should we care about post-harvest loss for food security reasons? Okay? Everybody oftentimes talks about, oh, alleviating food insecurity, uh, uh, addressing post-harvest loss is critical to our goal of alleviating food insecurity. It may be. Now, this is what makes economists so much fun, like myself, is to say, whenever somebody says something, I say, you know, are you sure? Are you sure about that? So I want to say a little bit about whether or not it is the case that alleviating post-harvest loss necessarily leads to reduction in food insecurity. I think it does, and I'll show you why, is there is less, because of post-harvest loss, is there's less food that otherwise would be available. All else equal, there's less food. We know that if there's more food, it means lower prices. The most, one of the most effective ways we can reduce food insecurity across the world is to lower food prices. That's critical to this. By reducing post-harvest loss, we reduce food prices, which benefits low-income consumers especially. Okay. Now, the other thing that people oftentimes say is, is it, um, if the other problem with post-harvest loss is that there's potentially lower incomes for farmers and others in the agricultural sector. Okay. Now, this may or may not be... Um, it, in low-income countries, we're especially concerned about farmers. We want to make sure farmers have enough income because, in part, farmers are generally poorer than non-farmers in low-income countries. So we might have to figure out ways to get them more money. One way to do it may be to reduce post-harvest loss. But we have to be careful with this because if we reduce post-harvest loss enough, that's going to drive down prices. That can hurt low-income farmers because their overall incomes will, be, will have fallen. So in terms of saying that this will benefit those in rural areas or benefit those in the agri farmers, ah, may or may not. It depends upon a lot of different factors that go into this. So, but at any rate, is, I guess I would say for food security reasons, I, I guess I do think it's worthwhile to consider issues pertaining to post-harvest loss. Okay. Now, I come to that at the end, I'll say, well, maybe, I don't know, compared to other things, but we'll see. Okay. So now, since they're going to be talking about ge the geographic distribution of food security, in the context of post-harvest loss, I want to pose a couple questions about this. Is the first thing is is that there may be a connection between the location of post-harvest loss and the location of food insecurity. In other words, areas with more post-harvest loss may have higher rates of food insecurity. Okay, and therefore we may be concerned about this. However, we need to be able to separate out association from causality. Okay, it could be that in areas with high post-harvest loss also have some other unobserved characteristics that lead them into food insecurity. So we have to be able to control for that endogeneity in looking at this issue. So we have to carefully separate out association from causality in this context. If there is a connection between post-harvest loss and food insecurity at a local level, that would indicate to us that we would want to be especially attack, uh, especially addressing issues of post-harvest loss in areas with high food insecurity. We would want to do that, okay? Now, however, there may not be a connection. It may be the case that an area can have really high rates of post-harvest loss, 
but controlling for observed and using a su suitable econometric methods to control for unobserved factors, it's no higher food insecurity rate, which might point us out to the fact that even though in a global sense, or even at a more aggregated levels, food insecurity, post-harvest loss makes a difference, at a local level it might not make a difference, and therefore is we may want to pursue other strategies. We may want to say, instead of addressing post-harvest loss in areas with high food insecurity rates, we may want to say, let's address post-harvest loss in areas where it may be more cheaper to address it or where the returns may be higher to addressing it. So just want to point out that these are the possible implications for the geographic distribution of this. And like I said, sure, Prashanta wanted me to talk a little bit about some, some of these things. Okay, now, I'll, okay. So here is a map. This is work that I do for Feeding America, which is the umbrella artist. So, uh, so this is uh, funded by Howard Buffett Foundation to look at county level estimates of food insecurity in the United States. It's the same story in low income countries. There's amazing heterogeneity in geography of food insecurity across the United States. You'll have, uh, this is the Mississippi Delta area. We have high rates of food insecurity. And you have pockets of high food insecurity rates in some of these areas. These are predominantly American Indian reservations in the United States. But there's enormous geographic variation in food insecurity across the United States. A similar story holds, this is for the full population. If we just look at children, children have much higher rates of food insecurity in the United States than the full population for various reasons. The reason I put these up here, I'm not talking about post-harvest loss is a moot issue in terms of food insecurity in the United States. That's not the reason I put these up here. The reason I put these up here is I'm going to use this as a motivation for how we generate these results and the implications for post-harvest loss. Okay? In low-income countries, there's also amazing ge geographic variation. This is a case of Central African Republic. As you can see, across the country, there's a lot of variation in food insecurity rates, including in, within very small geographic areas, we have quite a bit of variation in food insecurity. Here's something similar for Sri Lanka, enormous variation across the country. So the geography of food insecurity matters, okay? And thinking about the way we want to address food insecurity is we do have to, have to address this. Now, how did we get the results for, what I, for the work for um, Feeding America on Map the Meal Gap? This next figure here shows, and I'm not going to go into any detail, but the general idea is we say, here's the food insecurity rates as a function of all these other factors that we know influence food insecurity. Poverty rates, unemployment rates, median income, state fixed effects, year fixed effects, et cetera, okay? That's what we know influences food insecurity, okay? Now, and then, so we estimate this model, and then the next slide is not germane to what I really want to talk about, but I'll show you anyways. Using this model then is we impute, um, we, 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 we impute food insecurity rates at the, at, at the county level or, or at the more local level in the United States. So that's not what I want to talk about. If, if Prashant had instead said, let's have you talk about food insecurity and mapping it, I would have talked about that, but I'm going to skip over this now. So what I want to do now is in the next equation I'm going to show you is to be able to demonstrate something about um, post-harvest loss. Okay? Now, as I said before, see, I've, been, I've been reading this literature. I, I'm, a, I'm not a post-harvest loss guy. I'm, I, I, um, I, I don't do research in, the, in this area. But is I've been reading up in the literature and trying to find some evidence that post-harvest loss leads to reductions in food insecurity. I, I, I've yet to see the evidence. Somebody should correct me, of course, if I'm wrong, but when I'm reading the stuff, I don't see that. But if we were to, if we, if we were to do that, is we would then have this, is we'd have this, is we'd estimate a model where food insecurity is a function of incomes in an area, it's a function of the demographics, these are vectors of different things, function of other agricultural factors, which are important to look at, and also looking at post-harvest post loss. This is what I think we have to investigate. We have to investigate this vector of things on post-harvest loss right here, okay? This is what we have to, we have to in, investigate in terms, in, in, terms of this, in terms of this question. You know, I did my undergraduate at Notre Dame, and in all the classrooms, we always had a crucifix, you know, because of, of the Catholic University. But we didn't have them this ornate, so this is, this is very different. But anyway, is that, so is that this is what, um, so this is how we want to incorporate post-harvest loss into our model. And then we can begin to say, does post-harvest loss at the local level make a difference or not? Or is it more aggregate level? What do I have? I have like four more minutes, correct? Okay, so let me then turn to this final slide, which uh, hopefully will be of some interest. I don't know if the rest of it was, but okay. So here's some other extensions. That I, since I have the floor, I can talk about that. I think about other things we, we, we can think about this post-harvest loss and food insecurity. The first is, you know, 
I, have been I was asked to talk about mapping food insecurity in the context of geography, okay? But here is that um, we may want to investigate post-harvest loss over other dimensions at the household level, at the, you know, at very small neighborhood levels. I don't know what, what level we want to talk about it, but we can other approaches. The other thing is, is to look at this across countries. Like I said, some countries, post-harvest loss might not make any difference in terms of food insecurity. In other countries, though, it may make a big difference. And to think about that in this context, so make cross-country comparisons. The other thing is, is now, reducing post-harvest loss is not, some of these things that can be done are cheap. Many are very expensive, though. So if our end goal is reducing food insecurity, if that's our end goal, is what we should be able to start to be thinking about then is to do some cost-benefit analysis and compare these with other possible interventions. In other words, do we want to spend a million dollars reducing post-harvest loss, or do we want to spend a million dollars um, inventing even better GMOs? Which would be better at reducing food insecurity, okay? The next thing I wanted to mention is that the looking at the combined roles of different interventions, not just post-harvest loss. Of course, since I'm from the United States, in the United States, we love GMOs. The Europeans, eh, I don't know what their problem is, but not, not, not none of you, of course, but some of these Europeans don't like GMOs. But we, of course, love GMOs. The thing is, though, but I reckon the GMOs are great in terms of increasing yields, in terms of their second generation GMOs are improving nutrition intakes. They're amazing, amazing, amazing. You know what the other thing is? I haven't heard any discussion about this. I, again, I don't know anything about post-harvest loss. Is they may also help reduce post-harvest loss if appropri appropriately designed. Let's think about those interventions and, and how they work together. And finally, the last point is, is I, I always have this issue with how post-harvest loss is defined. Is it's, it's not what we produce and then we don't get it's also the efficiency at every point in the scale. Like, for example, if we're, um, if we're feeding pigs, let's say, is that we want to make sure that they're fed efficiently as possible. So efficiency over that is important. Or efficiency when we're planting things. If, if we have post-harvest loss for a little bit, it's maybe going to have plenty of So that's it. So, I, so as if there is questions for this, then I can take it.